So remember I told you that fat is an organ. It forms very early in life. And just like every other organ in your body, for fat to remain uh, vital and functional for all the purposes that we just described, um, it needs a blood supply. Right? It's, a, it's a mass, it needs circulation. And as fat actually gets its circulation naturally, uh, when your body needs to make more fuel tanks because it needs to store more energy. And so it makes another fat cell, another fat cell, another fat cell, and you're starting to expand that fat cell. And it's just a, not only the number, it's the size. So then you fill it up with the gas tank and now it's bigger and it's bigger and you've got another one that's bigger. Pretty soon your normal levels of fat. So this is the key point. We all want normal levels of fat. It's very healthy for us. Yeah. Important, very important. Okay. But when do you actually have too much fat, excessive fat, it actually becomes harmful because what happens is that as that fat mass grows bigger and it starts to billow. All right. What happens is it grows bigger and faster than the blood supply can support that it naturally has. So it desperately wants to get more blood vessels to grow, which is a process called angiogenesis, which I study how blood vessels grow to it. And this, this excess billowing of fat is where fat and cancers and tumors actually become very similar because tumors also start as small cells, just like a normal fat cell. But as it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, it needs a, it outstrips its blood supply. And what happens in both the tumor and in fat when it outstrips the blood supply, because it's just growing too big, the center of the fat or the center of the tumor starts to die. We call it hypoxia, not enough oxygen. It feels like it's getting strangled, not enough oxygen. It needs more blood supply desperately. And too often the growth outstrips the ability to recruit a healthy blood supply. And what happens is when parts of your, an organ starts to die naturally is inflammation. Mm -hmm. Inflammation kind of courses in there like bees coming to uh, a flower bed, all right? And what happens is that those inflammatory um, cells start to build up. Now, a big um, inflammatory mass of fat because you put too much fuel into your body, right? Um, like the overloaded tank, the spilled, uh, overflown gas tank in a filling station, the air will evaporate it away. So mm -hmm. if you, as long as you step away and you let the air uh, evaporate, you'll be fine. In the body, there's no evaporation. You gotta burn it somehow mm. and it's stored. And, and, and so but what happens is that when you're overloaded, it's, it's flowing in there. Yes, when it overflows, guess what? Your fat can spill out of, the fat, out, out of your, your adipose tissue. It can even accumulate in your liver, in, liver and spilled fat energy in our other organs, like our liver is poisonous. It poisons, it's toxic to our other organs. So when you grow up bigger, bigger, and it spills out, and it doesn't have enough blood flow, inflammation starts. And by the way, this inflammatory, toxic environment, this over, over, over split, spillage, you know what it does? It completely damages the normal orchestration of those fat hormones. The leptin, the volume switch, do we want it up or down? Do you want to be hungry or not so hungry? Who knows? The fat's too big. It's too inflamed. A dipinectin that's released to be able to have insulin draw in energy so we have normal levels of metabolism and energy in our cells. And insulin works well to you know for sensitivity of insulin. I don't know. We want it to be more sensitive or less sensitive. Who knows? Mm. Let's make a little bit a little bit thinner, less screwed up. And now your insulin system is not effective anymore. This is why excess body fat leads to metabolic syndrome. You really sort of throw your blood sugar use off and your insulin up. The science tells us that the foods that are uh, that encourage the excessive growth of body fat and that encourage inflammation and, uh, uh, and, um, and thwart our metabolism, kind of knock our metabolism, derail our metabolism, uh, are very much the same foods that are talked about as being not so good for you. Sodas, both regular soda and diet sodas with artificial sweetener sodas, um, non-caloric sodas, um, uh, uh, added sugars, too much added sugar, too much calories. I mean, that's like basically not, not just filling up your gas tank. That's like putting a jet nozzle and mm. jetting out that gas. Like your metabolism can handle it, but it, at a certain point, it's going to go, whoa, this is way too much for me to handle. Over time, again, 
once or twice, occasionally, not a big deal. Over time, that overwhelmingness of the metabolism leads to um, spillage, leads to um, uh, uh, waste, leads to uh, toxicity. Um, so added sugars. Number three, ultra processed foods. Now, ultra processed foods almost has become a bumper sticker. So let me mm. explain a little bit more closely. These are pro food products that, you know, big companies make, but even small companies make them. And they fundamentally take whole foods, raw ingredients, and they transform them and combine them in ways and extrude them and shape them in ways in which the product never doesn't doesn't even resemble food anymore. And so, you know, the, the, the fact of the matter is that, you know, the shape of your breakfast cereal or uh, some of the candy you might eat, you know, the combinations that's ultra processed and ultra processed foods also tends to be cheap. It tends to be um, live forever mm. or last for a long time. And it, the reason it lasts and it tastes great. It tastes great because it's artificially flavored, often with chemicals. It, it, it looks beautiful because it's artificially colored. Now, I know in Europe, for example, um, there's been, I think, a, 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 a faster enlightenment of protecting citizens by banning some of the artificial flavorings and colorings. In, in America, in the United States of, Amer of America, not so. There's still a lot of things that are banned in Europe that are common in, in, the, in the foods that are surrounding us now. Those damage our metabolism. They damage our health defenses. They damage our gut microbiome, which is connected to our metabolism by helping to streamline our metabolism. Um, so that's ultra processed foods. Anything that, by the way, you, you pick up and it's got like 20 ingredients and you look at them and you can't pronounce most of them and you can't tell what they do. That's something that is important that I sort of use as shorthand for people like, teach me Dr. Lee about what an ultra processed food actually is. I say, look, you know, that's a long, that's a long, there's a lot, a lot to say about that. But if you pick up a package and you read the ingredients, just like 20 ingredients on there and you can't define what every ingredient does, what it contributes, it's probably ultra processed. That's a good. That's a good way to look at it. Um, and then I would actually say that uh, other things that encourage derailing of our metabolism and overage, you know, unhealthy oils, uh, excessive saturated fats, like in red meats, mm -hmm. excessive, like a little bit good source of protein. Um, uh, uh, and I would also say processed meats, mm -hmm. uh, you know, because they they're processed. They've got all kinds of other chemicals and things associated with them. Uh, so. By the way, I just listed the same things that everyone talks about over and over again that are not so good for us. What I'm saying is that now we have another reason to understand that they actually derail our hardwired metabolism and they encourage harmful body fat to actually grow. Here, let me just show you. <laughs> yeah. I just happen to be in front of I just have to be in front of a desk so I can show you this stuff. Look Perfect. at that. Oh That's yeah, kind of beautiful. Stuff, right? It, and it comes like and it comes off of a plant like that. Okay, so what happens is that when you put it on your tongue, you feel the burn, the zing, and what's happening is that there's a bioactive called capsaicin. It actually is also, there's another family called capsinoids. They're mm -hmm. all that chemical family. And like a key that fits into a lock, your tongue has the lock. It's a receptor for capsaicin. It's a capsaicin receptor. There's a name for it, by the way. I know I'll be giving lots of easy to understand analogies for, for your listeners and viewers, but all right, we got to dive in and be a little bit of a scientist here. <laughs> that receptor is called trip V1. And mm -hmm. it, it's not only all over our tongue, but it actually is in our esophagus and our stomach and our guts all the way down to our intestines. And, it, and it's, and it's also at the very tail end, even our rectum. So you've heard that saying burning on the way in and burning on the way out. Yeah. Hey, you know what? That's because of trip V1, the receptor. But here's the interesting thing, the connection between body fat and thermogenesis. Hot chili pepper on your tongue, lock the key, fits into the lock, the trip V1 receptor. As soon as that happens, you feel, ah, it's spicy. Your tongue sends a text message to your brain, amazingly. And it tells your brain to do two things. One is to release endorphins. Endorphins are the feel-good hormones, which is why some people really are addicted to eating spicy food. Ah, I gotta have my, I gotta have me some more spicy food. Now, the other thing that and not everybody has the same degree of response. So some people, it's just way too spicy. They're, they're, they have too many receptors. They have the trip B1 is so dense in their tongue that even a little spice is overwhelming. Okay, but the second thing that that the capsaicin from chili peppers on the tongue can activate uh, with the text message to your brain, it can release norepinephrine. Okay. 
Norepinephrine is a flight or fight hormone. So basically put up your dukes, all right, or run away, okay? And what happens is that, and, and, and what happens when you do that? Your eyes dilate, uh, you start to sweat, right? And you remember people eating spicy food, they mm. often sweat and they turn red, right? Um, you start breathing a little bit faster. That's what's happening. And the next time you eat something spicy, um, I think you and I talked about this when we were in person um, uh, last year, but you know, this is what's amazing. If you eat something spicy and, and you just put yourself, like meditate a little bit, go into a quiet place and pay attention to your body, you will literally feel your brain, your activated brain, your texted brain releasing norepinephrine. You'll feel it running down the side of your neck because the norepinephrine is going down nerves. You will actually feel that sensation mm. happening, the current going down. And it goes right down to the brown fat that's pressed around the side of your neck to light up that flame. That's called thermogenesis. That um, uh, that that signal norepinephrine binds to a receptor on the top of your brown fat. It's called UCP1. Don't worry about the names. But what that UCP1 does, another lock and key on top of your brown fat, is it then ignites your uh, your uh, burner on your stove, uh, and then whoosh, it goes up. And now, in order to keep that flame going, it's got to draw the energy down. Right, so that's an example of chili peppers found in both Mediterranean cuisine, um, Asian cuisine, all kinds of Asian cuisines that actually are part of this um, culinary traditions that that you know are, are very much part of our humanity. And that's just one example of an ingredient and a mechanism. There's other ways, mechanisms that can work as well. But I thought I would start with thermogenesis. All right, well. You, obviously, you can see I'm, I'm in front of a table that's, that I've been using for show and tell. Here's one of my favorite fruits. It's a pear, okay? And it's a medium-sized pear. And pears are very nutrient-dense. It's one of my favorite fruits. Um, they're sweet, but not too sweet. They're not as sweet as a mango. They're not as sweet as a pineapple. Um, and they've got a lot of dietary fiber. They've got six grams of dietary fiber. And pears also have a bioactive called chlorogenic acid. Um, chlorogenic acid is not only found in pears, it's found in apples, it's found in coffee. You know, Mother Nature is very clever. She actually puts a lot of these useful bioactives across multiple food types. But I love pears, and I want to use this, uh, one of the things that I, I, a fruit I enjoy eating, to address this, um, I think it's a, it's an extreme interpretation, well-intentioned, about the harms of sugar and fructose. <clears throat> you know, I think as, as people, we, we love to either um, make a food a hero or a villain. Mm. And um, it is true, sugar, too much sugar, not good, good for you. But you know, our brain is, depends on sugar. Our body can make sugar. And so it's really not fair to basically say, oh, a sweet fruit is really bad. Um, fruits are very nutrient dense, which is they have sugar for energy. They have fiber for our micro, gut microbiome. They've got bioactives to activate our health defenses and activate our metabolism and activate thermogenesis as well. Here's what you want to do. You want to actually choose foods like fruits that have that taste great, that are pleasing, um, that also are nutrient dense and give you all these other factors um, that, that are good for your body. So net net, you're getting some energy from the fructose and the sugar. You're getting some uh, prebiotic stuff from the from the dietary fiber, and you're getting a ton of these bioactives to activate your health defenses. You just can't reduce everything to the <clears throat> sweetness of the fruit. That's ridiculous. And I think that it's very important to actually uh, uh, state that. Mm, yeah, yeah, I, th I think it's really important. And you know, when I look at an apple or a pear or a berry, I don't just think about you know it's got vitamin C, it's got a bit of sugar, and I'm thinking of like the hundreds, if not thousands, of different polyphenols that are having unique impacts on my body. Yes, some of it is on uh, on, on weight control, and you know all the things I've learned from your books, uh, but you know also on angiogenesis, on DNA, on our gut microbiota. You're, you're really, you're, I, I want people to really think about the wider aspects of what we're consuming on a day-to-day -day basis. And whole foods are just fantastic <laughs> at giving us that that huge selection of, of different uh, nutrients. Now, let me give you an example, though, where we do want to be careful. <clears throat> Oranges, citrus are wonderfully delicious. They're pretty sweet, okay? There's quite a lot of sugar in an orange. <clears throat> so people always ask me, well, what about fruit juice? Mm. And I tell people, 
you know what oranges citruses are are very nutrient dense they got dietary fiber anybody who's ever peeled an orange and eaten it slice by slice knows there's a lot of dietary fiber to it you can see it you can taste it you can feel it it's also very sweet um, which you know is good but too much sweetness not so good and it's loaded with bioactive like these polyphenols narogenin hesperidin uh, limonene like all kinds of great stuff that's good for your metabolism fights body fat <clears throat> activate your health defenses but let's compare an orange to a glass of orange juice now i like to eat i like i actually like orange juice but you know if you remove all the fiber from orange all the pulp you're getting you're removing a lot of the good stuff all right if you ultra process the orange juice like you see in a lot of the commercial inexpensive <clears throat> versions you can buy in the grocery store you might have actually removed some of the polyphenols as well mm. but even if you fresh squeeze it a tall glass of orange juice i could you know on a hot day and i want to slake my thirst that tall glass that'll go down my gullet i can whip it down in 30 seconds glug 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 right okay you know how many oranges in the sugar of or of those oranges it would take to make a tall glass of orange juice <clears throat> on average eight oranges mm. now i would eight never oranges. sit down and eat eight oranges at a time yeah that that's an example of where if you want the, the all the beneficial healthful benefits of fruits <clears throat> versus the juice if you choose the juice it's a lot easier to eat a lot more of that sugar compared mm. to the whole fruit First of all, I love mushrooms. Uh, it happens to be one of my favorite foods. <clears throat> Look, this is like, I'm on the Doctor's Kitchen podcast, so I got to talk about my, my enjoyment of, of food. And my, I, I like to cook like you. <clears throat> so, you know, there's nothing, whenever I go to the market and I see <clears throat> really good mushroom specimens, especially the ones that are seasonal or not that common, I'll buy them right up. Mm. They are mother nature's like umami bomb. They taste great. They're easy to cook. And you know, from a from a medical food as medicine perspective, I can tell you they contain um, a bioactive called beta D glucan. Happens to be a soluble fiber. So this this beta D glucan is not only a bioactive that activates your health defenses and activates your metabolism. It's a dietary fiber that feeds our gut microbiome. So mushrooms are good for gut health and overall health and our metabolism at the same time. Mm. Now, <clears throat> what's really interesting about um, beta D glucan is where is it found in the mushroom? Most people who buy mushrooms and cook with mushrooms get the cap. They cut off the stem, throw away the stem. And, and the cap does have beta D glucan, but the stem of the mushroom has twice as much beta D glucan. So if you're cutting mushrooms up, <clears throat> cook with the stem or do something else with the stem, you could put it into a smoothie, you could actually make a soup out of it, make a stew out of it, saute it. Whatever you're going to do, don't throw them away because they actually have a lot of this great natural resource that's good for your health and good for your metabolism. Eat some mushrooms instead of the meat. Mm. So think about it. That's five days of meat eating, two days of mushroom meeting. At the end of a year, they actually found that the meat eaters actually gained weight, increased their body fat, their waist size increased, the full meat eaters, just like mm. you'd expect. Mm. <clears throat> but the people who swapped it out for mushrooms just twice a week okay with something that can be made to taste like meat actually um uh put it on the grill put it in a barbecue put it you know saute them you can really get a really really nice unctuous kind of like flavor out of this umami bomb <clears throat> they actually shrank their waistline by an inch they lost by body composition some of the harmful body fat the visceral fat their blood pressure came down so mushrooms are really really powerful <clears throat> so brassica actually is a big family of of leafy stocky vegetables um, that um, all contain sulforaphanes now sulforaphanes they're called sulforaphanes because that's the natural bioactive that has a slightly sulfurous tinge to it that's why broccoli tastes the way it tastes that's why cauliflowers taste that way that's why bok choy has not only a little crispy bite it's got a little bit of a of a um of a, of a, of a spicy um, mm. uh, a smoky taste to it, right? So wonderful things. Um, uh, and, and so the, the key is that walking into the grocery store, it turns out that broccoli has sulforaphanes and most people eat broccoli, eat the treetops. And if you get frozen broccoli, that's okay too, because they're often flash frozen. And, but the thing is you're only getting the treetops, which does mm. have sulforaphane. The research I and other people have done has shown that the stems 
of the broccoli. Broccoli plant, by the way, is not just a bunch of treetops, all right? It is one giant stalk, like a telephone pole, with a treetop on top of it. And so most people who go to a farmer's market will know that, you know, when you bring home the broccoli uh, from the farmer's market, you cut off the stem. A lot of people used to throw away the stem, for gosh sakes, keep the stem, cook with it, saute it, slice it up into medallions, <clears throat> puree it and make it into a soup, add a little oregano, a little extra olive oil. You know, there's all kinds of delicious things you can actually do with the stock because there's, there's twice as much of the sulforaphane. 